Part 2, Earthquake Waves. There are four kinds of waves propagated by an earthquake. The first wave is the primary wave, a wave of compression and expansion. The second wave is a side-to-side -side movement, could also be called a shear wave. The third wave, a love wave, is side-to-side -side on the surface. And the fourth wave, a Raleigh wave, also on the surface, but is a more circular movement, similar to the waves on the ocean. The two most important waves, the P and the S waves, are the ones that we use to determine where an earthquake is coming from. The P waves, the compression waves, are usually not very obvious when you experience them. You might kind of feel them, but it isn't until the side-to-side -side S waves hit that you recognize that indeed you are feeling an earthquake. Then along come the surface waves, more surface movement, and these do even more damage than the P or the S. We use a seismometer to record these earthquake waves, and the recording is a seismograph. Take a look at this upper seismograph. It will move with the bedrock from east to west. As it moves, the rotating drum moves. However, part of the seismograph is attached to a suspended mass. And the suspended mass, because of its inertia, doesn't move. As a result, the difference between the mass and the pen and the moving rotating drum gives you the squiggly line of the seismogram. If, however, you want to pick up the movement that is vertical, you need a seismometer that is oriented in a different direction. Here we have a seismometer that records side-to-side -side movement. As the rotating drum moves, the difference between the movement and the drum is resulting in a seismogram, which you can see below. Another look at a seismogram reveals the P wave arriving first, after a lapse of time the S wave arrives, and then finally the surface waves. Here you can see two stations. Station A receives the P waves first, and then Station B receives them. But also, the gap between the P and the S waves is greater at Station B. So we can use that gap to determine the proximity of any station to the focus of the earthquake. We take the seismogram and look at the gap between the arrival of the P waves and the arrival of the S waves. In this case, the gap is five minutes. We then line it up between a P wave time travel curve and an S wave time travel curve. Only at 3,700 kilometers away would the gap be five minutes. So we've just determined the distance to the earthquake. Let's look what happens at three locations at the same time. The earthquake hits Denver first, then St. John, and then Lima. Notice that the gap between the P and the S waves differs because of their location. We take these three seismograms and we fit them to a time travel curve. Lima is 9,000 kilometers away, while Denver is only 2,000 kilometers away. We can now plot these on a map to determine where the epicenter must be. The epicenter is 2,000 miles from Denver, but that includes any place on that blue circle. With the St. John information, there are two locations that could be at both distances. However, you add the information from Lima, and there's only one place for that epicenter. This process is called triangulation.